have Professor Paximos with us. Uh, and uh, Eric and uh, Ari Ariadne will introduce him, and then we have, uh, uh, they, they, you know, feel happy to hear your, what you have to say, okay? Thank you. And I, I would like to add also that uh, Dr. Paximos has brought uh, this very interesting book that he has recently published, published, The uh, River Divided, and it is available at the back if you, any one of you would like to purchase it, it's at uh, 50 euros, the Greek version. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Hello everyone, I'm Ariadne, the President of the Public Society. I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Professor George Paxinos, uh, the neuroscientist from Up the Brain. He is a group of Australian neuroscientist born in Italy from Greece. He completed his BA in psychology at the University of California at Berkeley and his PhD at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. After a postdoctoral year at Yale University, he moved to the School of Psychology of the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. He is currently a Senior Principal Research Fellow at Neuroscience Research Australia and a Sancia Professor of Medical Sciences at the University of New South Wales. Professor Paxinos is a corresponding member of the Academy of Athens and the only Australian with this award. Um, welcome everyone, my name is Erika, I'm the President of Biomedical Sciences Society. Um, a little bit more on Dr. Paxinos. Although known for his impact on neuroscience, Dr. Paxinos has a history of campaigning for the environment. For over 10 years, Professor Paxinos was a leading proponent of light rail for the city of Sydney. His motivation had been to introduce, to reduce atmospheric pollution from automobile use. In 2021, he published a book, A River Divided a novel in the environmental genre where neuroscience principles and environmental issues are at the center, including the questions of whether the brain is the right size for survival. A River Divided was published a year later in Greek under the title Amazonius and Amazonas. Now we're going to move on with the lecture and at the end of the lecture we'll have a Q&A section. Enjoy everyone. Σα ευχαριστώ. Μα ακούτε. Λοιπόν, είναι ο κέφαλο στο κατάλληλο μέγεθο. Καταρχήν, ναι, ασχολούμαι με Άτλαντε. Δεν είναι πάντα κάτι που σου φέρνει χαρά όταν δουλεύει με Άτλαντε. Πρόσφατα, ο Άτλαντε, τον πρώτο άνθρωπο που φτιάξαμε, του. Α, πρέπει να speak in English, right? The first atlas we did uh, was of uh, the rat brain, and uh, it's 40 years this year that we published in '82. Uh, and uh, one uh, woman, a uh, girl then, had used the atlas for her PhD at that point, 40 years ago. Recently, I introduced myself to her, and she said, George Paxinos, I thought you were dead. <laughs> And uh, I'll tell you something about my pedigree in uh, psychology. Uh, recognize this face? Wilhelm Wundt, the name you might, right? The founder of psychology Leipzig in uh, 1879. Well, when I was uh, a student, young like you at Berkeley, uh, my professor was all retiring and uh, he said, anybody who shakes my hand, and of course I rushed to do so, would shake the hand that shook the hand that shook the hand of wound. So, maybe we can contaminate ourselves afterwards, uh, but if you want to, uh, pleasure to shake your hand. Uh, and that's, so my, that's my connection. But now I'm going to speak about uh, the human, where we are really, including psychological aspects, what is really uh, does, uh, does psychology have a soul? Has psychology lost its soul? Uh, and uh, I wanted to show you this, if uh, this uh, internet permits me, but it doesn't seem to. Uh, which is, um, no, the internet uh, has not achieved its connection, so we ignore it. Uh, it's an issue with uh, monkeys. So uh, I will say something about the book uh, that uh, Vivi kindly mentioned uh, and uh, uh, I will take you through my journey through the brain uh, 
some historical aspects of uh, neuroscience uh, to return with some conclusions uh, that uh, uh, I have uh, come upon uh, after uh, nearly 60 years in uh, neuroscience. And uh, uh, the reason that I wrote the book is because uh, I failed in whatever I tried in environmentalism. I see Stella here and uh, uh, she might agree with some of the ideas uh, that uh, will be expressed herein. Uh, and um, uh, I thought if only I could uh, uh, work upstream of behavior at attitude, so I would not have to stop someone from cutting this tree every time, but try to convince them that they should protect the tree, work upstream again of behavior at attitude, then I would be more effective. Certainly I was not effective in the things I tried to do as an activist. I even ran as a candidate of the Australian Cyclist Party. Uh, and but for 10 years I was thinking about this. I couldn't find an idea, a vehicle that would assist me to do this until one uh, uh, pre-Christmas uh, party that there are many of in Australia because uh, uh, we coincide Christmas with summer over there. Uh, and uh, somebody said to me, you're going to Spain, you should go and see the church San Juan de Compostela, where the bones of St. James are buried. And I thought, that's interesting, I'll get some DNA and see what the guy looks like. And then I thought, why not someone far greater? Uh, and uh, with that idea, I, the, the book asks the question, what would someone with the genetic endowment of Christ say about the state of the environment initially? Would he join Wall Street or street protests? And uh, 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 it took me a long time to do it because it's another thing to write uh, science, uh, another thing to uh, uh, write or attempt to write literature. Uh, and um, just before submitting it, the English version, a friend saw me at the cafe and the user question, how is the book going? And I said to her, uh, 21 years and I still haven't finished. Mm -hmm. She said, my cousin's novel was published posthumously, Metathanatum. Uh, I said, you're giving me hope. <laughs> I approached the publisher and, and he asked, what is this book all about? And I said, look, it's identical twins raised apart. It's how the environment shapes behavior, uh, how uh, as different artists would sculpt different statues from the same block of marble, different environments will produce, will mold different characters even in identical twins. It is about cloning Christ. Uh, it is uh, about um, uh, ethics, it's a principle about the environment. And he said, and on what shelf would I place it? <laughs> and until that moment I was convinced of Woody Allen's dictum, if you are a bisexual, you double your chances for a rendezvous on a Saturday night. <laughs> uh, and, uh, the book was published in, uh, uh, I translated the, the, an earlier version was published in Greek, Katikona, the title then, and this time I translated it, uh, and you know uh, when you haven't uh, written something well in the original in English, because Google will give you rubbish. But if you construct your initial language correctly, it's amazing. Sometimes paragraphs that I could not improve from what Google did. Uh, but I didn't rely on Google because uh, I didn't have the nuance of language enough and I uh, worked with someone for six months uh, 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 on the internet to go through every uh, sentence uh, uh, and um, uh, in the, you know that's really the way writers do except that uh, they are better at it uh, and I was, it was not my trade uh, but anyway uh, and uh, I'll tell you now about the scientific um, journey and then some extrapolations from it 
in science and beyond science in uh, the realm of speculation and philosophy. Uh, and uh, uh, we did uh, our first atlas on the rat 40 years ago, and that worked uh, because I had the good fortune of bumping onto a stain of the brain that showed the brain as though it was a colored in book that was colored in already. And here, if you <coughs> an example here, amygdala, uh, where uh, the, uh, I think um, Damianos is involved with the amygdala, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, you can see here the different parts of it in the monkey are clearly shown. You don't have to be a, a, a great neuroanatomist. I was not even a neuroanatomist, I was a psychologist. Uh, but I could tell a stain. Uh, so uh, we use this stain to identify things unambiguously, unlike previous stains where you really had to be a good anatomist before you made the uh, call. Uh, and uh, at that time, people were uh, saying the gain in the brain is mainly in the stain. And uh, here you have this fellow. I don't always stain the mouse brain, but when I do, I prefer acetylcholinesterase. That's the stain I use. Uh, and you might say, all right, the rat, and so that's your achievement in life. I thought, once the rat worked, I said, oh, let me try the human, it take me six months. I know now what the Volkswagen parts are, the Rolls Royce was the same parts. Uh, and, uh, uh, but then I said, before trying a uh, human, I better look at optimally obtained brain from another primate, primate with the hand in opposition, right? Uh, that is a monkey, a gorilla, and a chimpanzee. So I wrote to the Toronto Park Zoo for the opportunity to do a post-mortem on a chimpanzee once a chimpanzee died. Incidentally, I didn't have a photo of a chimpanzee, and I'm showing here to you and your and I hope you'll agree that externally we look similar, internally it's likewise. And uh, I uh, received a response, we would be happy to oblige you to give me the brain. But we haven't had a death of a chimpanzee in the zoo for a decade. Two months after receiving my letter, three chimpanzees died. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't suspect me. <laughs> I studied the brain of one of them. And uh, in parallel, uh, later, I studied the human using the same criteria. We found no areas of the human brain that don't exist in uh, the chimpanzee brain and conversely. And you might say, of course, okay, <coughs> by the way, it was brain stem <coughs> of the chimpanzee that I studied. Uh, uh, but you said, I could hear you say, brain stem, who cares? Uh, well, we should care because the dopamine, adrenaline, depression, uh, and uh, Parkinson's, uh, schizophrenia might be related exactly to these systems that they have had their origin in the brainstem and broadcast signals to the rest of the brain. Uh, but regardless, a lot of people are interested in the cortex. And there is a person who did a great cortical map, uh, for, uh, Konstantin von Economo and uh, his associate Koskinas. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, their map is not used. It's really mad. Uh, the most paradox that I have come across uh, that a far better map is not used than the Broadman map is used uh, by everybody. Uh, and uh, that's because they included the Broadman map in uh, uh, programs and therefore people just grab it off the net and go with it. But anatomists are stranger people and they uh, like to use uh, look at detail uh, and accuracy. And uh, we used the uh, cortical map of an economy, uh, in part at least, in our work on the Barnusen. <coughs> this is a small primate, the size of a small rat. But you can look at it, right? Like this. Uh, but it has a primate brain in it. Look at the brain. We did a study of it. it took us a few years, five years. And uh, uh, it seems, again, that there's nothing in the human brain that isn't present in this small primate's brain, and conversely. So there's homology between 
uh, the brains. So uh, for the, uh, the the chimpanzee, of course, is the closest one, but the monkey and uh, this is monkey and the marmoset that we studied um, close enough. The, the everything that exists in one exists there. It's not so for the rat. It's not so for the bird that we also studied. Uh, the scatterologous cortical regions in the rat, most of it is different in the cortex in the, the rat. In the bird, it's argued whether it does have any cortex. So, you know, uh, it's uh, different. So, 400 million years of divergent evolution has its consequences. Okay. So, we are not uh, the same thing as the birds. But you might say, well, you studied the bird before, I mean, the bird. Bird brains. Well, birds have first class brains. They just haven't had good public relations. And 70% uh, uh, of the brain of the bird is equivalent to the, bird, to the brain of the human. But the cortex certainly isn't. Uh, so anyway, uh, we um, tried to do the human cortex in the latest book in Jürgen May, uh, but we're not satisfied that we've done uh, appropriately the work. Um, our atlas is inferior to uh, uh, the atlas of for Economo, but that's not usable today. You see, there are other problems that you have there. Uh, you know, metrics was changed, all others because of that. Uh, and it's very hard to even, if, when you know what you should expect, what you find, because for Economo tells you that to actually find it and confirm it in your material. We tried some of that, we're still not satisfied, but there's another. Uh, toy in uh, play, and this is the MRI that uh, permits you to examine the brain in situ without taking it out of the calvarium. And I'll show you first an atlas using MRI that we made of uh, the ah, the video works uh, of uh, the rat brain. Okay, so uh, you can see. Uh, the entire brain, you can see also some of the connections because they have different color if they go from left to right, up, down, anterior, posterior. Uh, and um, uh, we uh, have published that this work and now we want to do uh, the work on the human. And now I'll show you data that we have not published yet. Hopefully we'll publish it in two years time. Uh, these are uh, data from a living person this is the brain of one of us. Three of us are involved in this project of constructing an atlas of the living, the living human brain. Uh, uh, Mark Shira, Mark is a 45 year old uh, man, uh, a collaborator. He has uh, stayed for 20 hours in total in the magnet, and uh, we've obtained uh, images which will think uh, are not surpassed and uh, that we, should, uh, we hope will permit us to delineate, to segment the brain and find what is what uh, uh, in more accuracy than the current uh, MRI DDI maps. And uh, you can see of course the connections in red that connect the two hemispheres to the corpus callosum, uh, the singular bundle here that's uh, traveling anterior posteriorly in this direction. You don't know which way, but at least you know that it's in that route. Yeah. And uh, the next one might not play the video. Let's see. Uh, ah, <laughs> my lucky day. <laughs> and this is Mark's uh, brain. And I told him how lucky he is that we were not studying his brain 20 years ago. <laughs> uh, and so you can see connections, there are some advantages. Of course, the resolution is not as high as histology, uh, and uh, we are still informing this with histology. So we're using our maps with histology and trying to see is that what we're seeing? And you, you only need to see Switzerland, only Switzerland, to find out where Germany, France, Austria, and Italy are. Uh, yeah. So you only need one part in that sea of the cortex uh, that you say, all oh, right, right, this is the 
uh, movement area, for example, and then you know uh, posterior to this is this, anterior to this, that, medial, lateral, etc. And uh, now, something about the history of neuroscience. Uh, we are our brains, and uh, uh, some pre Socratic philosophers rejected supernatural causes and medical explanations of the physical world and the nature of the soul, including the relation between psychological events and the body. These philosophers replaced myth with reality and banished gods and magic. Alcmeon was the one that discovered the relation between brain and behavior. And uh, he uh, lived in Croton, the uh, Magna, Magna Lava, Magna Grecia, uh, present day Crotone of Italy. And uh, you can see, by the way, there in, in Sicily where I went. Uh, you can see ancient temples from the Greeks who went there that are virtually intact because they were not in cities to be looted. Uh, and um, uh, this information seemed to have passed on to Kos, who lived the uh, greatest doctor of antiquity, uh, that is uh, Hippocrates. And uh, nobody has uh, praised the brain better than Hippocrates. Men ought to know that from the brain and brain alone derive our joy, our pleasures, our laughter, as well as our grief, sorrow, and tears. Unfortunately, uh, someone who came later, Aristotle, possibly the greatest scientist of antiquity, made a mistake and considered the brain to be there to cool the blood, air conditioning. Uh, and uh, the professor's greatness is measured by how long they can stymie progress in their field. And the followers of Aristotle just worshipped him rather than uh, learn from him. And uh, uh, we uh, have, uh, though, some opposition to the concept of uh, the cardiocentric theory of um, uh, the soul, as it was called then, mind, as it's called now. And, uh, of course, the original thought was the Egyptians, who thought that the brain was useless and sent, heedlessly discarded it in funerary practices and sent millennia of pharaohs brainless to their utter life. And uh, uh, there was another person here, that is Galen, uh, the father of pharmacy. And um, the encephalocentric uh, theory of Galen and the cardiocentric theory of Aristotle battled each other out until the dawn of modern science. And in uh, Portia, uh, in the Merchant of Venice, Portia asks, Tell me, where is fancy, where is love, where is fancy bread, or in the heart, or in the head? And if you, today, of course, does anybody have any doubt where love is bread? Anybody has any doubt? I went to find a card from my loved one, and uh, I was confronted with 300 cards for Valentine's Day, each one with at least one red heart on it. None with the brain. And I was forced to write a letter to the Muslim. La triangle, Sagapo Apotavati to Ejifan. Journalist from Melbourne, uh, Eric from Melbourne, uh, calls me. Are you insisting that the heart has nothing to do with love? I said, if in a heart transplant I get your heart, I am not going to fall in love with your husband. <laughs> so he said, what a pity, and he's such a lovely man. <laughs> Next time, send the brain. Now, so much struggle to find the seat of the soul. Psychology loses its soul in the 1930s. Nobody in psychology uses soul, the world soul. And if they were to use it, it would be cruel. A, a kid comes here for treatment with autism, let's say, and there's some behavioral difficulties. It's your soul. <laughs> your soul is to be blamed. It doesn't work. Psychoactive drugs 
psychotherapeutic drugs, antidepressants, antipsychotics, work anywhere else but the soul. All right? Or dopamine, let's agree, and don't if you like it, or then possibly 5-HT, maybe. But just don't consider it, not even think of it. All right? So, uh, uh, by the way, I gave a, a talk to the Australian uh, Neuropsychological Society, and before going into the hall, I asked at the coffee, uh, excuse me, do you have a soul? And the answer was always, pardon me? They couldn't believe the question, right? But then I got an answer from a girl. I did until I started my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so, psychology has no use whatsoever for the soul. For the, if the soul, just, just think for a minute, if the soul is where erethismi, stimulations, become perceptions, where <laughs> logic resides, where decisions are made, where love is manufactured, where memories are stored, then there is no reason to hypothesize its existence. Because there is already an organ that performs these functions. Uh, so, what is the situation? We lost soul, psychology lost its soul. Uh, what about freedom? You know, freedom is uh, very dear to the Greeks, right? Uh, and uh, uh, they, they all get, always get engaged. They ask me questions. I have journalists come sometimes speak to me, and they disagree. They ask me questions, and they disagree <laughs> with something that doesn't happen in the, uh, abroad. Presumably, you know, they take your word. Okay, that's what he says, right? No, he said, but how could that be that way? So uh, it is a paradox. Uh, I was uh, preparing my talk. Uh, I was uh, sitting in the cafe in Bondi Junction in Sydney, and ladies started across me, and I said, uh, "Excuse me, do you have free will?" And she said, "I do, but I don't think many people out there have free will." And this is the paradox. Everybody thinks they are free, but for the others, mm, they are not so sure. Well, I've got news. At least if you are going to believe most of neuroscientists, of course, the minority of neuroscientists could be correct, and the majority could be wrong. But most neuroscientists will tell you, you have no freedom. None at all. And the... the Argument is just below. The syllogism is just below. Be a Skinner, which I had mean, the opportunity to meet when I invited him when I was a graduate student at McGill to come and give a talk. But look, uh, he says that the uh, behavior is the outcome of two and only two factors our genetic endowment, over which we have no choice and we don't choose our parents, uh, or whether our grandmother, for that matter, was in drugs and uh, interfered with the methylation of certain genes. It's still the same genes, but some of them are not expressed. So I've got problems today because of my grandmother. You know that, you know, that story, Amartya Zvonem, but was a It's funny how I started to believe now in the sayings of my, the Bible, uh, but it, it's <coughs> some way, if that's true, that really the grandparent uh, <coughs> living experiences can have some influence. Well, where is the freedom of the offspring two generations later when it's influenced by such things? But the other factor, and only other factor, that influences behavior is the environment. And that includes intrauterine environment and subsequent schooling, what place you were born, uh, culture you were born, the friends, the TV, it's a great educator, or, or not, whatever it is, but it influences. And in this respect, behavior, uh, we are all, we are all genes sculpted by the environment. Uh, much like uh, this uh, sculptor, possibly Phileas, sculpted 
from Parian marble, this statue of Apollo in the Zoforo of uh, the temple of Zeus in Olympia. So does the environment sculpt our behavior out of the genetic endowment that we are granted. And there is no crevice in the march, genes, environment, genes, environment, for free will to wiggle in there and take part in the parade. And it is like Praxiteles uh, sculpted Hermine, that uh, Hermes, that uh, the environment sculpts our behavior. And uh, in the domain of love, I hope that some of you would have had some, uh, I don't hope it only for you, but some of you might have it, many you will overcome it, somebody dropped you and you wanted to throw that love away, to kill it. Uh, there is even a song in, in Espanol, devuelve mi mi amor para matarlo. But there is even a better saying I think, in, in Greek. Uh, what does Voskopulo say? <laughs> you find this in the literature um, in many languages, which may well reflect something, but certainly you might find it in your friends, if not in your own self, that you wanted to get rid of a love and you couldn't for a long time. At least somebody shaking their head. It's you know, more than one person is it's really worried uh, and assuring that, <clears throat> that it's not only uh, that the people that I encounter that, that agree. And, and uh, uh, so and this is not all idle talk of uh, an early afternoon by a neuroscientist. Uh, if somebody is abandoned, there are chances that this person will interfere with the person who abandoned them in uh, their house, in their work, in the internet, might hit her, might kill her, might commit suicide before they would change their affection to someone else who might love them even. It is just... Uh, if that's not a psychological datum, then I don't know what it is, a psychological datum. Because the person tells you, absolutely, I can't do it. If that's evidence that there is no free will in the domain of love, there are people in the 1960s who were homosexual and submitted themselves to brain surgery to lose homosexuality. If they could do so, because they're blamed also, that is choice, you made that choice, change. Well, the evidence is not that way, that there's any choice whatsoever, none, in love. Uh, and. Uh, and might say, oh, well, you found the weak spot of humanity. Well, <laughs> we, we, we have seen other things. Um, political beliefs are also difficult to change, and many things. But anyway, uh, that are impermeable to logic. There are people who, eh, but any, the thing is, at least if we today agree, by a large most of us agree, that in love it seems that freedom <laughs> is. Yeah, freedom light, if none, any at all. Uh, and uh, again, neuroscience will tell you, most of them, none at all. Uh, and uh, uh, the poet of the 19th century, Lord Alfred Tennyson, was right by half when he wrote in Odysseus, I am part of all that I have met. Okay? So that shows in a poetic way better than any of us who have been teaching psychology will be able to say it, that uh, uh, the environment is shaping us. And uh, of course as to what we are, uh, the most dramatic uh, revelation was that of Darwin that displaced humans from uh, their uniqueness uh, in, uh, in the, the uh, creation and even showed that there's no creation, uh, there's evolution. It was uh, a wound to narcissism uh, and self-adoration. And uh, 
to know ourselves, to know who we are, we need to know whether we are slaves of yesterday, whether we are really kings in, your skull, in our skull-sized kingdom, architects of our destiny, or simply slaves of yesterday. Well, I've got news for you. We are slaves of yesterday. The decisions that we will make today are absolutely based on the molding that our brain has suffered up to today. And any genetic predisposition, of course, will be added. Uh, we are slaves of yesterday. But psychologists are very clever people. Look what they discovered that today is tomorrow's yesterday. And today, they speak to you, cognitive behavior therapy, and they try to assist you on the things that you want, want your behavior to change toward. So, behavior is not immutable, not at all. You have a profession ahead of you. Uh, I made my living that way. Uh, principally with rats, though. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, of course, we, we are not predestined. Uh, if you uh, and, uh, take the view that the behavior can change, uh, as you should, uh, that become, becomes also part of you subsequently. So, uh, and you can show cognitive flexibility where some others who didn't have the benefit of you study um, have less of. Uh, and. Um, so, who, who would not like to lose our compulsions, our obsessions, our uh, un, uh, the unwanted, uh, those things that are uh, unwanted desires, undesirable desires, our love that torments us? Who wouldn't want to lose it? And according to Harris, the marionetta, the marionette, is free only to the extent that it loves the strings that pull it. And the first conclusion of uh, uh, this diatribe, Jacques Monod referred to the loneliness of humans. Humans live in the edge of a foreign, an alien universe, a universe that is deaf to our music and equally indifferent to our hopes as to our pain and crimes. And he said that well, uh, and you would expect that of a, no a nobelist, right? <coughs> if somebody starts talking to you like that, you should ask, are you a novelist? <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the third uh, conclusion, oh, uh, did we, yeah, we've got the seventh conclusion. The, yeah, so the third conclusion. Uh, I hope that I've convinced you that Hippocrates was right, that we are our brain. If so, then it's worthwhile reflecting to the title of my talk. Is the brain the right size? I mean, if all it is is our brain, there's no reason to measure anything else. Just measure the brain. Is it the right size? Of course, you notice that I have quotes, the size, right? Uh, but size does matter, huh? in the sense that the uh, chimpanzee has 600 grams, and we don't have any chimpanzees listening today uh, for that reason. Uh, okay. uh, and we have 1,300 grams. Uh, twice the size, and not the largest brain, but given the body size we have, uh, yes, we come out best. And the problem is that uh, we have also a delusion, uh, the third delusion. The first delusion was about having uh, a soul, and the second delusion is having free will. The third delusion is that we're made uh, in the image of God. I mean, you know. Uh, it, Whatever else uh, the girls that spoke before uh, may have resembled the divine, 
in their brain, I can tell you, they resemble the chimpanzee. Uh, and uh, this last one, by the way, is significant in the sense that uh, uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a hubris that is, uh, and given that we uh, we think so confidently about our capacity, humanity will overcome this. The brain is the most complex thing in the universe. And, I don't know where they've explored all parts of the universe, but certainly the brain to me, uh, the behavior, in, or when I see chimpanzees, remind me so much like humans. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, we face a problem. It's not all idle talk about this uh, hubris and all that. My, uh, the problem is the environment, really, and the reason that I wrote my book. Uh, that uh, I asked my uh, eight-year-old granddaughter, tell me something that you will do today that will not pollute. And she said, running. And I said, that's good. But if you run, you wear out your shoes, and the fact is going to make more shoes for you and pollute the environment. Running barefoot. <laughs> and I said, that is good. But uh, if you run, you build up an appetite. You eat more stuff and they have to bring more meat and vegetables for you in the city and they pollute with the trucks and also to make that stuff. And she said, then sitting in a chair. And I said, that's very good, but um, if you sit in a chair, you have to cut a tree to make the chair. <laughs> then lying on the ground naked. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I was uh, uh, also uh, wanted to tell her about uh, the issue of hubris, ivris, uh, that uh, the uh, gods, earlier gods, these gods are strange. Uh, the other ones, uh, were well, these gods for sure uh, don't treat uh, everybody equal. I mean, they have favorites, they have, they, certainly women, they don't seem to favor at all. I mean, religious by large treat the environment uh, no better than they treat women. Uh, in uh, the book you'll find uh, a religious person, because half the people are about uh, half the religious, except in Denmark, for some strange reason, there's 60-80% uh, not religious. Uh, and um, this religious person asks the question, uh, what uh, is the difference between Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, on one hand, and um, uh, Marie Curie, uh, Nightingale, and uh, Saint Teresa. And the answer he was searching was ordination. Every one of the previous, the first lot, can apply to become a priest. None in the second group need apply. Uh, and uh, the, the issue with the uh, religions and the environment is that uh, they are obsessed with sex and uh, they will not allow you to use even a prophylactic that would prevent you from contracting HIV. HIV is evil, but not as evil as prophylactics. Uh, and uh, you have uh, the paradox of people forced to have children when they might not want to have additional children, resulting in an increase in the Earth's population uh, from unwanted children of 80 million a year, which is the size of Germany that falls on the earth, like that. And of course, the impact of, on the environment is a multiplication of population times affluence. If the population is doubling, then if the affluence remains the same, the surface of the rectangle doubles. Right? So, uh, this is not uh, even talked about in the meetings like just the one in Cairo because religious people think that God is giving them the children. And they somehow should not interfere. They are obsessed with sex and they should not interfere with... Uh, they want to interfere with everybody else's sexual life. But not with uh, uh, putting a prophylactic that doesn't kill anybody. Not even an, an embryo, nothing. Anyway, so uh, uh, I was telling her about hubris, my eight-year-old granddaughter, 
And uh, I said, there was this king of Corinth who was condemned by the gods to push a rock uphill only for it to fall down and he had to push it back again the next day because he was narcissistic, egotistical and insulting. And she said, like Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so the gods did not have uh, much uh, uh, faith in, uh, uh, much, didn't much like the, uh, being compared, uh, the mortals comparing themselves to the gods, uh, and uh, uh, we have, in my view, uh, we have this, this situation where in our, we don't understand the limitations of our brain and we consider ourselves made in the image of God, uh, and uh, if only the brain or smaller than what it is, would not have been able to produce the language which gave rise uh, to uh, technology which they threatens existence. If it was uh, large, it must have understood the problem. You have heard of the concept of Goldilocks. Uh, the Earth is in a zone around the Sun that's not too hot, not too cold, and therefore habitable, and it's called the Goldilocks zone. Well, Goldilocks had gone there to find some porridge for three bears, and tried one, too hot, tried the other, too cold, tried the other, just right. Well, the brain is not in the Goldilocks zone. If it was smaller, would the beast, the monkeys are not a, uh, threatening themselves for us. If it were larger, it might have understood the problem. And uh, uh, I, my conclusion is that the brain is just not the right size, and I have evidence for this. Look at this. I studied what happens in uh, uh, Ithaca with uh, 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 helmets and um, zones, as well as and, uh, and seat belts. 36 people passed before me in half an hour period. Psychology is easy to study. Look, psychological data are all over the place, right? I sit there having a coffee, and there are 36 without helmet, two with helmet, 36 without uh, the, the belt, and 18 with. And guess what? They were fitting their cars with icons. The Konyesma guy. Uh, and uh, here you go with uh, uh, Sisyphus, by the way, uh, and uh, the situation is like this. Uh, E.O. Wilson, a biologist, social biologist, uh, uh, said, we don't uh, know why we're here. Puzzled we stand before nature. You can add a few things to that. Uh, some of it's actually what I'll add is his, but you can add to that. We have a brain that contains remnants of the reptilian period, snakes, in our, in our own brain. Uh, might be some, uh, uh, you can see some of them over the history of humanity, the history of wars. Uh, and uh, you can find that we have paleolithic emotions, if we only understood that. If we understood uh, that we have uh, Thesmus, institutions that are medieval, that are really not suited for a time where humans have to watch over the population. Uh, uh, it took me 10 years to pass a resolution on population from the Australian Academy of Science. It just to touch a, a point, okay, because the Christians would turn against you. And I don't doubt the other guys would turn against you too, which are the Christians that are bad, uh, the other ones. Uh, have a problem with sex too, obsessed by sex. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, what I think needs to happen, I don't think it has a chance that the humanity will construct a sustainable society, but there's also nothing more important than trying to construct a sustainable society. And that's why I wrote the novel. And um, uh, the, we have to understand what the truth is, who we are, uh, and what the brain, the capacity of the brain is, and the, the predilections of the brain, and can't possibly allow our brain to hold nuclear weapons that will wipe all, all humanity, let alone put it in the hands of Trump, Kim Jong-un, and Putin. And uh, uh, then, uh, armed with the truth that we are another primate on the planet, uh, that has a civilization, much like the giraffe is a big neck, who has a big brain, but 
that does not confer infallibility that's required to deal with what we're constructing, that we set our stern to the dawn and not to the graves of our children, and that we make wings of our oars. And uh, with that, I'll just take you on some uh, slight tour over some of the places where the thing is set, that's Jerusalem. And uh, uh, here uh, in uh, crucifix, and here are the lit uh, stones on the top of Golgotha, uh, covered by glass and uh, the lanterns. There you cannot take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the uh, Wailing Wall, Ithaca, and uh, in the monastery there's a nice icon. Uh, uh, though uh, here we have Piazza di Spagna, some action takes place there in the novel. Scalinata, Piazza di Spagna, St. Peter's, St. Peter's Parthen Pantheon, Antiguo Cafe Greco, and then here we go to the River Divided, which is the, uh, uh, in the, the Greek version of the book, is uh, Amazonius Anamesamas. Uh, and uh, there are two brothers that are uh, identical twins, they don't know each other's existence and they will meet on you know, the opposite sides of the environmental deba uh, uh, debate in the Amazon uh, divided river that uh, has different catchment areas, different acidity, uh, different temperature, different color and uh, the brothers will meet for one moment only to be lost forever. And uh, here is the forest. And uh, here's uh, Buenos Aires, uh, the uh, medical school where you find uh, the events from the Polytechnic in Athens, uh, transported to Argentina of uh, 2020s. And uh, there uh, I was with the uh, first love of Che Guevara, uh, Cecilia Ferreira, who allowed me to use it my conversation. Uh, in uh, the book for the purposes of it and uh, uh, unfortunately she died uh, this year and I uh, uh, would like to wish all of you that your brain shrinks less than what is expected for your age and thank you for listening to me. There are questions. Most well, I think there are some questions. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your interesting talk. A question regarding the illusions that we have for free will and uh, the place of God. Uh, so you think that these are all byproducts of our brain? It can only be, yeah, but, but why though, if there's a final question, yeah, I'm going to touch on the final question. Why, I mean, what did that serve to have to believe in delusions? Uh, well, Harari speaks of it, it's all speculation, of course, uh, of how cohesion in the group would have assisted uh, and uh, being out, uh, outcast uh, would be more difficult to cope. Uh, against the elements, against the animals, against other tribes who wanted your, uh, your cave. Uh, so uh, presumably a, a belief in gullibility in that way. What surprises me is that those same people who believe uh, in uh, these conspiracy theories that uh, uh, whatever the Democratic Party is abusing children in a pizza hut in somewhere, uh, and set out to go there with their car. When they meet me in the street, they see me and they avoid me. They don't hit me. I mean, to believe that other thing, it has to be uh, more general than that. No, they're specific. Yeah. Yes, there's a question about that. case that you have encountered while studying human brains, for example. 
a change that we did not expect. Uh, something very, very extraordinary. Oh, yeah, oh, what surprised me the most yes. from uh, the way. Uh, yeah, well, that was the similarity that really it was a similarity of our brain that I could not find something different between the brain, our brain. And that you can see why, because we are only 8 million years of uh, with a chimpanzee of divergent evolution, 11 year, million years with the monkeys. Uh, the birds, you can find some differences, but that's 400 million years. Uh, yeah, but it was not known to science before. Uh, yeah, even with the bird, we thought that they were far different than what they are. We identified 180 areas in the bird that are homologous. They correspond to the human. Uh, that's because we took it systematically, really. We stained the human, uh, well, the rat brain and the, and the bird brain with the same stains, same criteria, and. Uh, if something, uh, will use if something uh, is in the right position, firstly, not in the wrong neural uh, and has uh, the same uh, chemicals uh, or the same connections, the same types of cells, then we call it uh, homologous. So there were 180 areas that people didn't know before that uh, correspond to the mammal, even though it was. So nature is conservative, really. Uh, uh, the birds are dinosaurs, but you know, uh, they, you can look at them. Uh, they, uh, giraffe has the same number of vertebrae as we, seven, as the right of vertebrae, right? Uh, it's, they're bigger, but they're the same number. But the bird, no, uh, they have 15. Uh, it's like the dinosaurs, they want more. And uh, you can see their uh, feet, right, their paws. Is like the dinosaurs, you can see the shape like the dinosaurs. So they are dinosaurs. Uh, the birds. So yeah, but so we separate them <coughs> for hundred million years. Yes. Okay. So what you mentioned previously about free will and religion, um, it got me thinking about predeterminism and predestination throughout religion. So. Do you think that somehow we have always known that we are not truly in control of ourselves? Uh, well, the religious uh, assume that you have responsibility, uh, and if you, for a moment, you assume that this position of the, new, of the majority of neuroscientists, which, again, it could be erroneous, uh, if you assume that there's no free will, all of a sudden, hell disappears. I mean, that's a good thing. If you make a watch hell here uh, uh, and now amongst us, there's no hell. Right? That's it, you know. So that is a good thing. Some anxiety might um, uh, uh, also leave us because we no freedom, therefore, we cannot possibly be considered uh, uh, responsible. But there's other benefits to believing that there is no freedom, and that the person who wronged you could not have done any other way, given their background, than the way he, the person acted. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see that you can forgive them easier. You can understand them, even for yourself to understand them. Well, okay, I might not want to have company with this person anymore, kill my brother, but I can understand it. Okay, so you can uh, cope with yourself. I found something uh, after say, giving this lecture for some time that somebody reported back to me from, who spoke to one lady who lost her son to drugs and she was blaming herself for something that she did that was the outcome this way and not another way. Uh, and once she found out that from my friend who conveyed the second hand this story of um, no free will, she said that she felt some relief. So, I mean, this is a PhD thesis for some of you, if someone wants to look at that. That is, can you work on the person who is in bereavement and blames on the top of it themselves for the circumstance, which is a step worse? to cope with this by the truth. 
if you believe it is the truth yourself as well, then, then or at least you know, give that information to this person that uh, there's this view to consider the things. And she said, this lady said, for me too, I tried whatever I could, and I had my limitations too. Yeah. So it, it, there is some uh, uh, some benefits besides losing. Uh, Colacy, I mean, that, that's a big deal today if I can announce it to everybody. Yes, uh, Linda. No, I'm really sorry, but they have a class now, oh, yeah. and uh, we have to wrap yeah. the session. Uh, thank you so much. Right. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you.